morning hmm. that was so cold good morning. good morning that was so cold good morning, good morning. Oh, slept well. that's very good and um oh for the learning from the day one to this moment have we been learning no that was too cold hunter have we been learning from day one till yesterday? It sounds like everyone has not been learning. So I'm receiving a cold answer. Have we been learning from day one till yesterday? That was a cold answer. Have we been learning? Mm, this was a cold answer. It seems like um, we haven't been learning anything. Seems like we have not been enjoying, like we have not been having fun. Because if you have, I can, you should get a, you know, a vibe and you know, shout. Do you get what I'm saying? So, have we been learning having fun from the day one? Yes. Young people, are you, I think these old people, they are not learning anything. So, the young people, have we been learning and having fun from the day one? Can you see the vibe? Young people are giving me the vibe, but no. Okay, good morning once again. Um, my name is Akindeli Cherish. I am an advocate and a peer counselor and from Association of Positive Youth living with HIV and HIV in Nigeria. So, I'm welcoming you to this section. Thank you. So, we're coming into this section now. You know, we're saying accelerating the progress so was obliterating the HIV treatment gap. You know, the HIV treatment gap for adolescents. You know, we have some gaps in the HIV treatment for adolescents. Young people in the house and adolescents, do you get what I'm saying? Are we giving it the idea? Are we able to give it the idea? Thank you very much. So, my name, okay, I've said my name. You know, my name is Evangelia, is Cherish. And I have this beautiful coach here with me. You know, she's beautiful. Smile chiming, however, to introduce ourselves. Good morning. I'm Allison Agu. I'm a professor of adult and pediatric infectious diseases at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, where I run a clinical research program that focuses on adolescents who are at risk or living with HIV. Before we even start, I want to really highlight Cherish, who's not just been my co-moderator, my co-planner, my co-lead. She has been fantastic. And this collaboration has been a perfect example of how you work with adolescents to lead. So just give her a hand right before we get started. OK, thank you, everyone. And um, we have our great presenters in the house. You know, we have a great presenters in the house to show us the gaps to have a solution to the gap to highlight some pinpoints that we the adolescents and youth we needed to know so i will be introducing um dr billand tapsena sorry can we give him a round of applause as he can help <laughs> yeah he has been doing great for adolescents and young people Dr. Leslie Anani, come up to can the we, stage. Can we, can we give him a round of applause as he came up? So, on my coach, I will be introduced in the second person. And let's have our abstract presenters come on up. Saras Mugo. Sorry, let's give him. Oh, no. As we people are coming up, please, I want us to share them with a round of applause, you know, that give them the vibe. So, can you give them a round of applause, please? So I want to welcome everyone. And last but not section. least, given Monana. <laughs> and also, Sarah's Morgan from Kenya. Is it here? Thank you. 
So I welcome everyone to this section, and I want to remind everyone we should put our mobile phone in silent place. I'm a good example. I'm doing that. Hi, I'm a good example. I'm putting my phone in silent, so you also should do that. Thank you very much. So before going into the our section, we we'll have to show us a case presentation that shows the gaps that we adolescents and young people have been facing in HIV response. So young people, you most, I want us to focus on this case presentation video. I want us to judge something down. I want us to highlight what is the problem we are having. And I want us to highlight the solution we want ourselves. You know, it's idea to give us what we want, no, not what they want us to do. Do we understand what I said? Young people, adolescents, are we in the house? This medicine helps us treat HIV. Taking this every day keeps us healthy, strong, and secure our future. But we don't want to just survive. We want to feel good in our hearts and minds. But there are things which can make this difficult. We have faced many losses in our lives. Parents, siblings, and friends. These losses are painful and often not talked about. We have so many questions. How did I get this virus? Why me? As adolescents, we want to be like our friends. But our HIV status, going to the clinic, lifelong medication makes us feel quite different. We live with shame, stigma, rejection and even violence in our communities, schools, and sometimes in our homes. People's words can be painful. The way they talk to me and about me hurts, and I feel so alone. We worry about our future. Will I finish school? Will I be able to get a job? Will I have a partner or children of my own? How will I be able to support myself in my family. All of this can affect our hearts and minds and how we feel each day, our mental health. We get anxious, we feel depressed, we lose hope and start to question if life is worth living. You may see me smiling, but inside I'm hating. Uh, look for ways to cope and to block out pain with alcohol or drugs. I'm afraid to tell people how I'm feeling. Afraid that they might think I'm weak, mad or crazy if I do. We know the medicines control HIV in our bodies, but we stop taking them because what's the point? But it can be so hard to talk about feeling this way. So we struggle silently. Yeah, thank you very much. Adolescents in the house, I will learn the gaps. I think we are learning the gaps. So this is what adolescents and young people go through. You know, it's not just about the drug. It's about what we we'll think. You know, some healthcare workers, they just think it's all about the drug, come to the facility, give us the drug, and they don't even think, they are not worried about what we feel, what is in here. All they do is just, it's about the dog. So we have to tell you that it is not just about the medicine, it is about our mind and our hearts. So I will be inviting Dr. Brilliant to talk more on the highlighting the treatment gaps and challenge, including policy issues, impacting access, so Dr. Belen Sabsanan is a medical doctor and a public health practitioner with over 10 years experience. Wow, that's nice. In the medical field, transitioning from being a 
clinical practitioner to a public health professional. Is currently the program manager with Zaventry. Wow, that's nice. Can you please give him a round of applause? So he has had previous roles with increasing responsibility in other NGOs, working in the HIV treatments and care space, and he has experienced work as a clinic clinician in public sectors for Zimbabwe Ministry of Health and Child Care. Wow, I think that's amazing. These are the people we want. It's not those people that they are not experienced. You know, some, they are not experienced. They just work in the facility and they just do anyhow. We want experienced health facilitators. We want experienced doctors. We want experienced health care workers, not non-experienced. Please note that. Thank you very much as I welcome Dr. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Cherry, for, for, for that introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. And I feel highly privileged to be standing in front of you this morning. And uh, my task is to be talking about highlighting the treatment gaps and challenges, including policy issues that impact access. So I think this is day three, and we have had a lot of discussions around you know, some of these issues that we want to talk about. So they have sort of made my work a bit lighter because I'll sort of be repeating some of the things that we have already had um, in some of the sessions over the past few days. So this is my conflict of interest um, declaration. And this is going to be my presentation outline. So just uh, to begin with, I'll just define a few terms just to make sure that we are flowing in the same wavelength. When I'll be talking about adolescence, I'll be referring to that phase of life between childhood and adulthood from ages 10 to 19 years. And you will see the abbreviation AL, HIV, quite often in the presentation. Um, this will be talking about um, adolescents living with HIV. You, when I talk about HIV treatment gap, I'm referring to the difference between the number of people receiving antiretroviral therapy and the number of people that are eligible for treatment. And this is those, both those that are diagnosed and undiagnosed. And access to antiretroviral therapy, I'm referring to the ease at which HIV positive patient can receive medication. And then HIV criminalization, I'll, I'll be referring to the laws that either criminalize otherwise legal contact or increase the penalties for illegal contact based on a person's uh, HIV positive status. So just a bit of background, um, globally we have 1.65 million adolescents aged 10 to 19 that are living with HIV. And as we have already heard, um, Sub-Saharan Africa is disproportionately affected with approximately 90% of these cases. And when we focus on the treatment gap, uh, it is approximately 35% globally. Um, and it is wider for the adolescents compared to the general population. So uh, I have some visuals here that are showing a tremendous uh, success over the past years in rolling out of antiretroviral therapy in the general population and also in the adolescents. On the left, you are seeing rolling out of antiretroviral therapy amongst the general population, including adolescents and the elderly. And our rollout up to around 2022 was at uh, 76%. But if you focus on the right, where we are looking at adolescents alone, you see that our rollout up to around 2022 was at uh, 65%. So this means that the gap is wider for the adolescents um, compared to the general population. And even if you look at the years going backwards, the gap has always been wider amongst the adolescents. So when you look at uh, some key insights uh, and considerations that we should look at when uh, focusing on adolescents, I won't dwell much on this. We had a very beautiful presentation from Professor Baker uh, when she was talking about, you know, adolescents being that period where many people begin to explore their sexuality and as a result, access to sexual and reproductive health information and services become increasingly important. So we find that this is the stage again where adolescents um, experiment um, with new experiences and increased vulnerability, and some may experiment with injecting drugs, sexuality, and sexual orientation, and some may actually be exploited um, sexually. So this is a stage where it's actually a window of opportunity which we can intervene early if we want to have success with addressing the treatment gap amongst uh, this age group. So we have just seen a video here 
uh, where the young people themselves were explaining the challenges that they um, experience and there is no better way to try to get these challenges but than hearing from the young people themselves and we heard them talking about the issues that are affecting them talk of losses personal questions that they have stigma all the issues that affect their mental health leading to alcohol and substance abuse and defaulting their medication so when you look at the challenges that uh, then impact antiretroviral therapy access they are many really difficult to compress in a presentation but i tried to group them into internal factors mostly those that we have heard from the young people we also have external factors as well as uh, policy factors and i'll go into these uh, in more detail starting with the internal factors we had the young people talking about stigma and discrimination and stigma is just those commonly held negative beliefs among the general population that discredit a particular group of people and in our case we are talking about adolescents that are living with hiv then discrimination these are the behaviors that then result from those beliefs then self-stigma among adolescents living with hiv occurs when a person takes in the negative ideas and stereotypes about people living with hiv and sees themselves in that way and this can actually be three times more common than social stigma and in a study that was done in zimbabwe by nicola willis and their colleagues um, published in 2020 it reported that 73 percent of adolescents living with hiv that were enrolled in their program experienced stigma that affected medication and adherence so you find that stigma affects all the important outcomes that we talk of when it comes to hiv care and treatment then focusing on mental health that we have heard again the young people talking about we find that there is higher prevalence of common mental conditions amongst adolescents that are living with hiv compared to hiv unaffected adolescents as shown by research and these mental disorders are associated with poor hiv treatment outcomes including poor adherence that then affects our treatment gap and virological outcomes as well as poor retention in hiv care and increased mortality so i tried to show here how these internal factors act individually but also combined to cause you know non-adherence and an increase in the HIV treatment gap. So I'll move on to talk also about the external factors, um, beginning with gender inequalities. We have already heard, I think we spoke more about this yesterday, when we were referring to adolescent girls, which are disproportionately vulnerable to HIV infection due to greater physiological risk, gender inequality, unequal gender norms and gender-based violence, including intimate partner violence. So while HIV prevalence is about equal between girls and boys age 10 to 14 in sub-Saharan Africa, you find that differences start to emerge when you get to age 15 to 19 with prevalence higher among girls in most countries. And I think these are important statistics to consider when we are, want to then tailor, make the interventions to target adolescent girls um, and young women. Then the other external factors that are playing a significant role in um, increasing this treatment gap you talk of healthcare worker attitudes where negative attitudes of healthcare workers affect adolescents more than adults particularly those adolescents that are living with hiv and studies have been consistent to show that adolescents often avoid engaging with health services including hiv testing and treatment due to distrust in healthcare workers related to judgmental attitudes and perceived lack of confidentiality then there are also knowledge gaps where in sub-Saharan Africa, from the population-based surveys that were done, uh, about 26% of adolescent girls aged 15 to 19 years and 33% of adolescent boys of the same age group, only that had a comprehensive and correct knowledge of HIV and AIDS. So you find that these knowledge gaps also hinder access to testing and treatment of undiagnosed adolescents living with HIV and also result in poor treatment adherence and continuity in treatment due to lack of understanding of the benefits of treatment. Then I'll move on to focus on the policy issues as well that affect access. Um, there are case finding gaps, especially among adolescents. We find that coverage of HIV testing and counseling remains significantly low among young people that are aged 10 to 24 years, according to UNICEF. And self-reported survey data from Sub-Saharan Africa indicated that only 9% of adolescent boys aged 15 to 19 years and 13% of adolescent girls of, from the same age group had been tested for HIV and received the results in the past 12 months. So when you look at some of the strategies that we use for our case finding among adolescents, we talk in our programs of targeted testing, 
We also talk of index case testing and provision of testing in high yield entry points. But despite all these strategies that we are utilizing, we continue to have um, case finding among adolescents uh, being low. So it means we need to do more to find adolescents that are living with HIV. And there seem not to be enough linkages between health services delivery for adolescents and other social services um, in order to reach adolescents and services that address their holistic and complex needs. Then um, on the policy issues, I'll focus also on the age of consent to HIV testing. I, I'm not trying to, to reignite the, the, the powerful debate, you know, I'll call it the Elena versus Wallet debate that we had yesterday, but I'll just focus on, on, on the facts that, that I have on this one. Uh, that legal barriers, including age of consent, and I'm talking about HIV testing here, um, and parental consent laws continue to hinder access to services, including sexual and reproductive health services for adolescents and youth. Um, adolescents are often reluctant or afraid to seek services that require the consent of a parent or guardian, specifically the SRH services, including HIV. So age of consent to HIV testing services varies between countries, and the age of majority, which is the legal age at which an individual is considered an adult, is not necessarily also related to the age of consent in, in most countries. So when you focus on WHO guidance, it allows for HIV self-testing to be offered to adolescents 10 to 19 years old, amongst other groups. And research has also shown that allowing free adolescent access to HIV testing services is associated with higher testing coverage among adolescents. I don't know if that will make you revise your voting from, from yesterday. So this one is a busy slide, but I just wanted you to focus mostly on um, the column one and maybe column three, which is just focusing on what I've been trying to explain now on how countries really differ when it comes to the legal age of consent to independent HIV testing and counseling among adolescents. So you'll notice that South Africa, for example, is at 12 years. We look at Mozambique at 16 years, Zimbabwe is at 16 years, Uganda 12, Ethiopia 15, Malawi 13, and these ages are continuously being revised across the countries. And I'm sure as policymakers are sitting, they go through that same debate as we had uh, yesterday as they try to find consensus on when adolescents can be allowed to uh, consent for HIV testing. But these are some of the policy issues that then impact uh, and affect HIV testing and increase the treatment gap because, you know, adolescents just won't go for testing when they need consent from their parents from what the researchers have shown. Then I'll also focus on uh, criminalization uh, and punitive laws as well, where uh, punitive laws have been shown to block HIV service access and increase HIV risk. So you find that countries that criminalize key populations saw less progress towards HIV testing um, targets over the last five years uh, with significantly lower percentages of people living with HIV knowing their HIV status and achieving viral suppression than in countries that avoided criminalization. So particularly underserved and Populations are adolescents and young people from key populations. I think we spoke in depth around this yesterday, especially the LGBTQI community. So we have other harmful laws as well uh, that include those around HIV exposure, non-disclosure and transmission as well as drug possession and use that are criminalized heavily in different countries and the laws are different in different countries. So decriminalization is a critical element to end AIDS by 2030. However, despite the compelling evidence, we find that many discriminatory and punitive laws, they still remain and they are varied across uh, the countries. Then last but not least, um, I'll also talk about non-involvement of young people. I think this uh, conference has been so clear about uh, young people saying nothing about us without us. So it is important for us to involve young people um, in our policy, but you find that more often than not, young people are often not involved in policies or consulted in policy making. And um, it has been shown through research that participation of young people helps to build trust among those served by the programs and to make programs more comprehensive and responsive to the needs of young key populations as well as creating more enabling environments for HIV prevention. So I would like to acknowledge um, my boss, Nicola Willis, as well as uh, who is the Exrandiri Executive Director, as well as my colleagues, Nicola and Vivian, who also had an input in this presentation and their, and, um, their comments. I would like to also acknowledge the organizers of this beautiful conference. I think 
you can agree with me that it has been a good time and we're still having a good time here. These were some of the references that I used. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Billiard. That was fantastic. Um, so we'll go ahead and do the second part of the case, if we can. Talk amongst yourselves, don't worry. <laughs> So while, while they're bringing up the case, I'll introduce Dr. Leslie Inani, who will speak after the second part of the case. Dr. Inani is from the University School, Indiana University School of Medicine and Riley Hospital, United States. Um, she's an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Ryan White Center for Pediatric Infectious Diseases and Global Health at Indiana University School of Medicine and serves as a director of their pediatric HIV services at Riley Hospital. Dr. Inani's research centers on HIV and TB care for adolescents, specifically investigating adolescents' HIV HIV and TB outcomes, care engagement, and interventions. She's received NIH funding, which is big funding, to investigate adolescent disengagement from HIV care in Western Kenya and to develop a tool to assess risk for disengagement. We need people who know that medicines alone are not enough. We need people to talk to who understand our minds and hearts. We need people who don't judge us when we say life is difficult. Listen to us. Don't call us crazy or tell us to be strong or man up or use any other language about HIV. That says we are not worth as others. We need to know that we are loved, safe and we belong. To know we can talk about how we feel, to share our worries, and to know we will be supported by the adults in our lives and our peers. We need to live a life with joy, to feel connected, and to be our very best. With time, support, and understanding, we can find healthy happiness and hope. Dr. Nani. We need people. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Leslie Anane at Indiana University. I'm uh, delighted to be with you all for this conference and to talk about how we eliminate the treatment gap. Next slide. Do I move it on? Okay, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so as we've, as we've heard, there's many uh, gaps across the care cascade for adolescents with HIV. And I'll be talking a little bit about what we think is needed to bridge these gaps. And I have to say from the outset that the current evidence base is still uh, limited uh, for some of our interventions and strategies to improve outcomes across the care cascade. Um, but I'd like to point to just some select uh, innovative, creative, effective examples uh, that we can point to as being promising for further uh, implementation and study and uh, the solutions that we can look towards. And at the core of everything we're going to be talking about is just this basic concept and framework of adolescent-friendly services that I think this room uh, you all are very familiar with in terms of the WHO defined uh, characteristics for adolescent-friendly health services and how those are applied in HIV care. Um, and that should be our starting point, uh, but it's also the lens uh, through which that we can look at these interventions. I wanted to take a look at the uh, pop art trial uh, that was conducted in Zambia and South Africa. Uh, involved uh, community-wide home-based testing, uh, universal testing and treatment um, for uh, across the, the communities where, that were in this cluster randomized control trial. And what it showed was that you could make a tremendous impact on uh, knowledge of HIV status among adolescents. Um, however, it was notable that the impact was not quite as great in adolescents as it was in uh, the older age groups. 
And you can also see um, some differences by age strata and sex, so in younger adolescents and uh, males having a little bit less impact on knowledge of HIV status, uh, but at the same time um, did show that you could impact that first and second 90 through community-wide um, universal testing and treatment. Um, so to, it does give us a sense that we need to do more for adolescents to reach them and to meet their needs. And so here in Lusaka, uh, this is the Yatu Yatu intervention that includes uh, community uh, peer-led HIV testing, incentivized HIV testing, and these uh, very youth-friendly hubs. And so rather than doing HIV testing in the home, um, making a center that's friendly for adolescents that includes comprehensive services, including HIV testing. And this had uh, also a significant impact on adolescent uh, and youth uh, knowing their status. Self-testing can take it a step further in meeting adolescents where they're at. And um, a couple examples, this one from Nairobi, where peer mobilizers were able to recruit youth through different settings and found a, a pretty high um, acceptability of self-testing with the highest acceptability in uh, bars and clubs as compared to homes and pharmacies, high completion of self-testing. Um, and they noted that participants wanted to see more self-testing options at different locations, inclusion of PrEP in these services, and low cost. In Uganda, a intervention with peer-delivered HIV self-testing and delivery of oral PrEP medications. Uh, this was conducted with a young women who were on PrEP, but who had suboptimal uh, PrEP adherence. And uh, trained peers visited uh, these young women monthly uh, to, deliver, to deliver their oral PrEP, but also to carry out HIV self-testing. And again, this was shown to be highly acceptable uh, with completion of self-testing and, um, and with delivery of PrEP, though they did note uh, that there were still some barriers, um, particularly for PrEP adherence, um, but that there was a very motivating impact of peer support and also feeling that this was a female controlled option where they could control their own uh, prevention and testing. For care engagement for those diagnosed, this is where I've done the bulk of my work in terms of um, qualitative research in particular with youth who have had uh, disengagement from care as well as those maintained in care. And we see that the core needs that youth have include adolescent-friendly services, supportive care providers, accessible and destigmatizing care, um, as well as an environment of peer, social, and family support, and financial resources uh, to stay uh, engaged. In Kailicha, South Africa, uh, this study found that adolescent-friendly services impact uh, retention and care. So they um, compared youth clinics uh, with propensity score matched general clinics and found um, lower attrition in these uh, youth-friendly environments. And similarly, in this study in KwaZulu-Natal, they did find an impact on both retention and viral suppression when in the adolescent clinic versus a standard clinic and when controlling for other factors. Uh, moving beyond the clinic setting, differentiated service delivery care models can help impact the, the barriers that prevent adolescents from continuing to engage in, in a clinic setting. So as you see here in this model, uh, Fan Mi uh, from Haiti, they described how they uh, set this up in their setting with the needs of youth in mind and addressing those barriers to care. Um, this intervention, sorry for speaking a bit fast. Uh, this uh, cluster randomized controlled trial from Zimbabwe uh, looked at the Jandiri uh, intervention as compared to standard support. Um, and the uh, community adolescent treatment supporters, or CATS, being the active uh, ingredient for this intervention. So comparing um, CATS uh, peer support uh, as compared with a standard of, of youth counselor, adult counselors that all received. Um, and as you can see in the graph, they showed a tremendous impact, a significant impact on uh, virologic failure and mortality being lower uh, when uh, individuals received the CATS intervention. And they also did some important work looking at the advantages and opportunities um, that uh, came about this uh, for the CATS supporters, um, but also needs that they have to make sure that they're well supported, uh, trained, and mentored. 
Um, moving to the psychosocial interventions that uh, were highlighted so effectively, um, this is where a lot of my work has uh, identified challenges for those disengaged adolescents, really complex barriers related to mental health and trauma, a stigma as we've seen in the video, um, and needs for peer and family support, um, as well as uh, the impact of poverty and financial barriers to care. Um, a recent uh, systematic review and medic analysis uh, showed uh, the impact of different kinds of psychosocial interventions that can range from uh, theory-based uh, interventions to more nonspecific interventions, but include things like motivational interviewing, CBT, economic empowerment, peer support, and looked at these uh, together as a group. And they did see a, a low to moderate um, but significant effect on adherence for these interventions when taken as a whole. And I wanted to highlight a couple of interesting examples. So the very uh, impactful and successful friendship bench model that originated in Zimbabwe uh, involves problem solving therapy and, in a set of sessions by trained lay counselors or grandmothers as they're, as they're called. Um, and this has been a very uh, highly successful model uh, for uh, mental health care delivered in, in a um, uh, lay provider uh, context. And in Zimbabwe, they've looked at um, applying this model to youth living with HIV and found a um, impact on acceptance of HIV status, reported in adherence to ART, as well as um, lower uh, symptoms of, of depression. In Botswana, they took steps to adapt it uh, further for um, an adolescent model and had delivery by near peer counselors um, ages 18 to 35 and found that um, they had high acceptability of this and also found some initial feedback for how they might uh, impact their um, further implementation. Um, and then as you see here in this cluster randomized trial uh, involving John Deary, uh, the John Deary model uh, with uh, a comparison of CAT support with problem solving therapy as, to oppo as opposed to standard CAT support. Um, while they did not find an impact on viral load in this comparison, they did see a tremendous impact on mental health outcomes, which is critical. And I think most likely the lack of impact on viral load is because the comparison is that highly effective CATS uh, support. Uh, looking to um, impact from poverty reduction, this prospective study from South Africa has um, modeled the pathways by which economic well-being can impact ART adherence through having enough money just to get to clinic, uh, but also having enough food uh, to take medication and uh, lowering stigma as well as anxiety and depression. And also from that project, uh, they've modeled how development accelerators or social protection factors can impact retention among other key targets. So for example, that government cash transfers uh, may uh, impact HIV care retention, and even more so when they're combined with things like parents, parenting support and uh, safe schools. It's a really exciting evidence base there. And then in the SUBI plus adherence uh, intervention in Uganda, uh, this has looked at um, matched youth savings accounts and fam financial literacy training and combined with a package of interventions and has uh, seen impacts on adherence and viral load, uh, as well as risk-taking behaviors and mental health outcomes. And um, in further work, we'll evaluate the individual components of that combined package. Um, but these are relatively small um, numbers of studies where there's a lot of evidence and there's a, clearly a need for a greater evidence base in this area of psychosocial interventions to try to address uh, these uh, complex barriers for adolescents. And I've listed a number of, of these here. And critically, there's a need for more expansion and scale up of youth-led interventions, including uh, those delivered by youth, but also having youth involvement in the development of research priorities, conception of research uh, through design, implementation, and dissemination. Uh, and in my own work uh, in Kenya, we've had um, a lot of uh, work in this area where we've involved uh, peer mentors on our research team and developed an adolescent and youth advisory board for research to find ways to involve youth across each of those stages. 
And then as we heard uh, very well from Dr. Tosca yesterday, um, there's a need for targeted interventions and exploring how to target those interventions. And so I've listed some of the groups here who might either have acute needs or needs that are unmet, uh, particularly by current models or health systems or policies. Um, and so there's um, several groups um, that we need to be thinking about as we design studies, um, including adolescents who may be pregnant, postpartum, those who have experienced or are experiencing violence, uh, sexual and gender minority youth, among other key populations. And then further research needs include those in the areas of implementation science and human-centered design, um, again, developing youth-led interventions and approaches for scale-up, those along the uh, stages of linkage, retention, and transition in the care cascade, cost analyses to understand how to, uh, to inform the uptake of these interventions, and, um, and understanding what are the most effective strategies or combinations of strategies that we can look towards to optimize outcomes. Um, and so I think as we've seen, there is a need for further research to identify and op optimize uh, these uh, interventions for adolescents to, to optimize care. Um, and care outcomes across the care cascade. Um, but we clearly see that youth peer-led, differentiated care models and integrated services should be implemented, uh, further expanded, studied, and scaled up. And uh, just that the, uh, the current sea change of having more youth-led participatory research uh, is vital and very much welcome. And so I, I wanted to acknowledge and thank all of the adolescents, youth, caregivers, and individuals who are involved in each of these studies that uh, I've presented, also to my research uh, team, mentors, collaborators, and uh, to my funding. Just thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Please, can you appreciate our presenters? Um, adolescents and young people in the house, are we learning it? Are they learning what we need? Are they? Remember, it is what we need and not what they want to give us. If they are not giving us what we need, we can just, you know, say no. They are not giving us what we need, you know. On it. So, I will be calling on um, Dr. Sirius Mungan from Kenya for the abstract presentation and impact of HIV literacy and viral suppression among youths with HIV in Kenya. Thank you. Can you please give him a round of applause? You can hear me? Okay, great. Okay. So good morning. I'm honored to be presenting uh, this work on behalf of my colleagues at uh, Kenya International Hospital University of Nairobi and uh, the HIV program in Kenya and our colleagues at the University of Washington in the US. So we cannot overemphasize the continued uh, need to invest in adolescent HIV treatment programs, seeing the higher incidence uh, in this group compared to children and adults, poorer treatment outcomes, largely due to adherence challenges, higher impact of HIV stigma and poor mental health. The interventions that have been developed and implemented globally have rightly focused on treatment optimization, adherence support, disclosure, and transition of adolescents to adult care, as we've had in, uh, throughout the conference. While many of these interventions do include HIV literacy components, few studies have um, attempted to quantify the role of HIV literacy in the outcomes they produce. An example of a successful intervention was the ATTACH study uh, carried out in 2019 uh, to 2020 and had two components, a disclosure support uh, cartoon book uh, and a transition support cartoon book. So why take my medicines and take in charge? So this package, named the Adolescent Transition Package, was evaluated in a cluster randomized trial in Kenya and was found to improve uh, transition readiness. The disclosure component was focused on adolescents in HIV care who did not know their HIV status, while the transition intervention focused on youth ages 15 to 24 who knew their HIV status. The transition component uh, intervention had components such as HIV literacy, communication, independency care, and others. 
So we will focus on the HIV literacy component for this presentation. The main outcome we are interested in is viral suppression. And so we describe HIV literacy among youth in this age group, 15 to 24, determine covariates of undetectable viral load, and specifically assess the effect of improving HIV literacy on undetect undetectable viral loads. We utilize gen generalized linear models for the inferential analysis, and note that we only included those with detectable viral loads at baseline to determine the effects of improving HIV literacy. More than two-thirds of young people included um, had been on ART for five years or less, so this was uh, a group that was relatively um, new to the HIV program. And only 13% had been transitioned to dolutegravir um, in that period between 2019 and 2020 uh, when this study was done. Other factors are very common in a basic uh, HIV clinic. So this graph um, shows us the differences in five HIV literacy com uh, domains that were assessed at baseline and 12 months later. We uh, see significant improvements across all domains, but mo notably uh, more um, youth could explain what HIV is. Um, they could also explain what, how ARVs work, and we see there was a big shift in the one year. And they could also explain what it meant to have a suppressed viral load. But we saw smaller improvements um, where adolescents uh, noted um, knowing the names of their ARVs um, and defining the cutoffs for viral suppression. So whether you're suppressed, well, what really is that cutoff? So we created an overall HIV literacy score combining all these components on a linear scale uh, ranging from 0 to 10. And we saw that the mean change at month 12 from baseline was 2.45. Intervention clinics had a significantly higher um, difference in HIV literacy than the control clinics. And this was uh, shown in um, uh, the results of the main study. So the blue bars in this graph represent undetectable viral loads, that is below 50 copies per meal, the orange ones, uh, low-level viremia, and the red ones, unsuppressed, which is below, um, which is above 1,000 copies per meal. There was very minimal change in the orange bars, that is the low-level viremia group, but we see significant reductions in the unsuppressed and significant increases in the undetectable groups. So that is where we saw the shifts uh, in the one year. And we did not see any differences in the intervention and control groups uh, for the main study. This is a bit busy, but the forest plot um, is, is a representation of the analysis we did with the baseline data. We looked at the relationship between various factors that are listed on the left and undetectable viral loads. So factors with a significant association are adjusted for age and gender, while the duration on ART and duration since disclosure, where a higher duration was associated with lower likelihood of having an undetectable viral load. The longer people were in the clinic, uh, the less likely they were to be suppressed or have an undetectable virus. You know, the difference is uh, significant there. Compared to young people still receiving treatment support from caregivers, those who are independent had a higher likelihood of having an undetectable viral load. And as expected, those at a higher WHO stage had lower likelihood of having an undetectable viral load. But very counterintuitively, and that is the very uh, last one, the very, uh, the very bottom, a higher literacy score at, at baseline was associated with a lower likelihood of having an undetectable viral load, and we'll discuss possible reasons for this. So on the other hand, we found no effect of improving HIV literacy on undetectable viral loads at month 12. That is one year after we enrolled them. Um, so, and this was specifically for those with, an, with a detectable viral load at, at baseline. So we just looked at that group and saw whether improving their HIV literacy helped them. We show on this table results for the stratified analysis by ARM um, and um, include results that are shaded in orange for the continuous um, exposure variable. And then we have them 
um, categorical variables just below there, basically just showing that we had little effect of HIV literacy on suppressed, on, on, on uh, having an undetectable viral load. And so in conclusion, we note the significant uh, improvement in HIV literacy over the one year, especially in the intervention arm, highlighting the benefit of um, interventions such like ATTACH. But we saw an inverse association between HIV literacy uh, and undetectable viral load, likely because HIV literacy interventions focus mostly on those who have poor treatment outcomes. We basically just focus on them and, uh, you know, give them a lot of information. Meaning that at any point when you cross-sectionally look at the people who have better knowledge are those people who generally are not doing very well. Um, improved literacy, however, had no significant effect, and this highlights the need to complement these interventions with other behavioral um, and biological uh, interventions, especially for subgroups with risk of non-suppression. I wish to thank um, the attached team that worked really hard to provide us with this data, uh, our participants and um, our funders, the NIH. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. And um, coming up on that is um, Given from South Africa. We'll be talking about understanding the factor that impacts the mental health and medical adherence of adolescents living with HIV beyond their status. So can we give him a round of applause? Um, good morning. Am I audible? Perfect. Um, good morning once more. Um, thank you very much for having me. And um, as it was said, my name is Given Monama. I am all the way from South Africa. And I'm here on behalf of the SHM Foundation. Um, so what do I do? I am a mentor and facilitator with the SHM Foundation. I'm working in design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So a quick introduction um, on what the SHM is. So the SHM Foundation, oh, okay, slides, no? Okay, yes. So the SHM Foundation is a charitable organization based in the UK, um, and we run multiple projects. We support organizations, we fund other organizations and individuals and projects. So today, I'll be speaking on one of the SHM Foundation's flagship programs, which is Kuluma, specifically. So Kuluma is a social support group. Um, yes. I keep on forgetting the slides, do bear with me. Um, <laughs> so Kulum is a flagship program of the ACHM Foundation, uh, which provides psychosocial support through mobile phones, aimed at addressing the mental, mental health and well-being needs of HIV-positive adolescents in South Africa. Um, Kuluma was first launched in South Africa in late 2013 um, across two clinics, which is uh, in Pretoria and Cape Town, uh, to provide a cost-effective a scalable solution to growing challenges of mental ill health. Uh, from the Kuluma project, a mentorship program was developed which uses the train the trainer model um, where willing participants are trained to deliver peer-to-peer -peer psychosocial support in digital groups to young adolescents living with HIV. Um, the following insights which I'll be presenting are based on an ethnographic study carried out by our Kuluma mentors um, so while I was engaging and networking with my learned colleagues and friends here, one of them asked me what ethnography is, right? So to provide a brief introduction and description of, of what ethnography is. So ethnography is a branch of anthropology which involves observing people in their own environment to understand the experiences, uh, perspectives, and everyday practices. So why did we choose to use an ethnographic approach in this design? So um, by the use of ethnography, we were able to gather results which are authentic, raw, and unfiltered because we go into the participants' environment and um, interact with them at their level and understand their cultures and everyday practices. Um, to mention, um, this study was done under the, under the supervision of Dr. Nikita Simpson, an anthropology lecturer at the SOA, SOAS, University of London, and with ethics approval from the University of Pretoria. So, um, what did the study involve? So before I get into that, I want to just reiterate that uh, this study was young people-led. 
So young people wanted to go out back to the community since they represent a certain part of the greater majority of people living with HIV. They wanted to go back and re-evaluate the challenges that young people encounter since these challenges constantly change and evolve. So they wanted to go back and understand so that we can tailor innovations which deal with these challenges. So, one, we investigated the complex and intersecting challenges that adolescents living with HIV um, experience through their own eyes and in their microsystem. This is their immediate surroundings, their household, their healthcare facility, and their community. Moreover, we wanted to understand how young people deal with, with, deal with and manage these challenges. These are the strategies that young people use to thrive and survive. And also we wanted to understand how all these challenges are worsened by substance abuse and belonging to the LGBTQI plus community. Among other things, um, people who were involved in our study, we had healthcare providers, hospital stakeholders, uh, caregivers, adolescents living with HIV, and members of the LGBTQI, LGBTQI plus community. We wanted to gain insight into social and structural barriers to addressing the mental, the mental health and adherence needs of adolescents living with HIV. And also how these stresses might be mitigated to prevent poor mental health and adherence in adolescents. So speaking to a few of our observations, I'm not going to touch on all of them. However, I think as we all know that transition from adolescence to adulthood is quite a difficult process for young people. Um, it is characterized as a stage uh, where there is great physical change, psychological, uh, social and behavioral challenges, of, which often impact the mental health of adolescents and their medical adherence. And speaking to a few points, um, as other abstract presenters and other presenters have mentioned, we also noticed that transition from, from pediatric care to adult care or adult immunology has quite been hard on adolescents. As a study that was done by Brian Zanoni in the M Health intervention, this process where, uh, where young people are moved from adult care to, from pediatric care to adult care, this is quite a very hard process since they're moving from a more nurturing care, a more um, caring environment to where now you have to act and be an, an adult. No one is going to focus on you as an individual. However, you are going to have to um, make means or be comfortable with the tough love that they want to give you. Um, okay, I'm on time. Thank you. So, um, after all this, we were able to uh, determine that safe spaces are key to young people. So, this, what are these safe spaces? These safe spaces are places where young people can, can be free, comfortable. This involves their healthcare facility, their community, um, their immediate surroundings. These are key to young people and these have um, a great impact on their mental health and overall adherence. Um, as one of my other, one of other presenters who mentioned that um, we need adolescent friendly clinics which are tailored to provide specific adolescents needs since um, ad uh, adolescents want these specific uh, spaces. Um, there are a few things which our, our mentors who carried the in ethnographic study said when participating in the ethnographic study, which I will not touch on a lot, but this was done to build research skills in them and also to make sure that they are able to understand young people and build better healthcare facilities for them. Um, pardon me if I stumbled and mumbled a bit, but yes, that was my presentation. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Can we give another round of applause for our presenters? So we'll be moving to the questions and answer. And I'm very sure we have a lot of questions. And I will be expecting the adolescent and young people to have a lot of questions. But before we go to the question and answer, um, I just want to chip in little things to remind us. What I want us to remind us is that um, we just don't want um, our voice to be heard. So I think I'm saying this on behalf of the adolescents and the young people. We don't want our voice not just to be heard, but we want actions to be taken. We don't want uh, the 
our voice just to be heard. Like, okay, we've heard you, we've heard you, we've heard you. But we want actions to be taken place. That's the one important thing I want us to notice. And the other thing is that I want us to notice peer-to-peer relationship is, is very, very awesome. It's very, very important. I think I came to realize that peer-to-peer a relationship is, is important. Um, when we had a workshop in my country, you know, adolescents gathered together in a room. Like, while taking an ARV, you know, we use alarm to, to get us reminder. My alarm was ringing, your alarm was ringing, your alarm was ringing, your alarm was ringing, and we were like, wow. So this is the time you're taking ARV to, you're taking ARV to, you're taking ARV to. And you see someone that is not doing well, you know, doing a peer to peer, um, Pressing peer group, pressing peer in, in this section, you know, you, you try to help the other person, you know, you keep tracking, you know, you be like, oh, this person is doing fine. I wish to be like this person. I also want to be doing fine. I want to be like this person. So I just want to go, I don't, I don't want us to forget that peer-to-peer relationship is important, please. Thank you very much. And we will be moving to the questions and answer. Do we have any questions? One, two, three, okay, four. Okay, she was the first person, so. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Doreen. I'm from Nairobi. So I have a few questions for Given. First of all, you talked about the transition of uh, AYPs to are from the pediatric cl- clinic to the adult. At what point do you intervene before they transition? Because this is something I personally struggled with when I one day walked into the clinic and my file was lit- written adult. And now I have to be in the big people clinic and I don't know how to interact with them. So at what age do you start the intervention? Uh, the second one is uh, relationships and disclosure. I don't think you talked about that. Young people struggle with dating and the aspect of disclosing to their sexual partners. How do you intervene with that? And uh, also the pill burden. I've been on ARVs for 18 years. It's not an easy task. So at how do you tell them that take it one day at a time instead of for the rest of your life? Because that is what we're told. Thank you. Um, well, uh, good morning. Uh, my question goes to uh, Mr. Brilliant, and the other panelists can also um, answer um, to it. So, um, I'm Lazarus Ndilenga. I'm from Namibia. So, uh, I run an organization called uh, Youth Empowerment Group, but I'm also a senior uh, NAT. Uh, in, in our region, we call it NAT, but uh, it's more of kids. So, one, one, one thing that I have... Um, I have, I have noticed um, it's, uh, peer-to-peer models, they do a work, they do a, it's, it's powerful, the power that comes with peer-to-peer is good, using young people to provide services, but at times these young people um, are seen as um, volunteers, they are seen as uh, not professionals, and the, the biggest question that I have is who's supporting, how do we make sure that uh, like, uh, who's providing, who's taking care, who's supporting this peer um, peer uh, to peer counselors or peer to peer counselors. Yeah, the question should be in that line. <laughs> so we'll, we'll take all the questions first and then go through. So go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Ujizi Mwendam. I'm from Malawi. I can say I got a lot of, a lot of questions, but. I won't ask a few. Um, first question is coming from uh, accelerating global toward operating the HIV treatment gap for adolescents. Um, what law can adolescents themselves play in closing the treatment gap? First one. Number two, how can communities and families support adolescents in access and adhere to HIV treatment? Number three, how can we measure blood list toward closing the treatment gap for adolescents? Um, a second question is coming from um, this topic, uh, impact of HIV reduce on 
viral suppression among youth with HIV. What are the major challenges and barriers to HIV redress among youth with HIV? Last three. We we'll come from there. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why don't we pause there? Why don't we, because we're getting a, a back of a question. So why don't we start with the first set? We'll, we'll pause because I realize people have a lot. So let's pause and get the first set because we'll forget what the questions were. All so right. We, Thank you. Okay. Where we maybe start at, at that end because that was the transition and, and go from there. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, so, in terms of transition, um, so I didn't get enough time to mention everything in my presentation. However, so as part of our model, we run support groups whereby we recruit um, young people from these centers, right? Uh, we put them into support groups whereby they engage on a peer-to-peer -peer level with healthcare workers from that particular healthcare facility, right? And moreover, we occasionally set up round tables between healthcare workers and the participants for them to voice their needs um, on either side to be able to fill the gap. So participants do state uh, the problems that they encounter when it, comes to, when it comes to transitioning from pediatric care to adult care. And then furthermore, on top of that, we also have our mentors who visit healthcare facilities um, on a regular basis to assist um, young people with that transition. Uh, we also recommend that um, sh should they feel that they need more assistance, they can get in touch with us. And also, um, on another question, how do we intervene in disclosures and relationships? So yes, I understand that um, it is not easy, which is also on, on our study we had uh, also observed that. So in terms of relationships, um, in these support groups, we deal with a range of things. That is one of the factors which are included in our support groups. Um, we also bring in the caregivers and parents to hear the um, issues that young people have and also in terms of disclosure um in our study there was, there was one thing that we found that disclosure um if they do not disclose young people they often carry the burden alone and that's actually hard on them you know so it, it's quite uh, 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 a controversial one but um and also speaking to one of the questions um in terms of transition um i think um, Brian spoke about the intervention that they do. So with me, I noticed, I, I, I thought that was actually a very good intervention, which we can actually also try to incorporate in our activities with young people. And finally, um, speaking to a question that was asked regarding peer-to-peer -peer support, as part of our model as well, we pride ourselves in supporting the supporter. Because they support others, but they don't get support. So we also bring in healthcare workers, psychologists, um, social workers to come and support the supporter. Since I'm as a young person living with HIV, um, you're going to support other people, but you also have your own burden. Um, acceptance is still a very hard thing when HIV, no matter how long you've had it, but acceptance is always going to be an issue. So we bring in people to also provide support to them. I hope I answered most of the questions. I don't know if anybody else wanted to add to that. Yeah, I wanted to, to specifically answer to, to Lazarus. I think the question has been responded to quite well. Um, in the Jandiri model as well, we, we consider the nuts, as, as you know them, or the kids, as they have been spoken in the presentations, as our first beneficiaries. Um, as they offer support to their, to their peers, we consider them also needing support. So we do have healthcare workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, whichever is necessary. We make sure that they are available to also offer them support. But we, especially we have our district teams, will be in the various facilities and districts we'll be supporting. They offer similar support that the kids will be offering to their peers. So, for example, where we need mental health screening, we make sure that our teams also screen the kids for, for mental health and other services like that, so that we don't sort of ignore them. Thank you. Maybe, maybe uh, oh, sorry, were you adding less about um, Really great questions, and uh, I agree with uh, the wonderful answers so far, but I did want to highlight the question about pill burden. Um, which is an important one, and I think that um, as we move towards the, the rollout of uh, long-acting injectables, I think um, 
there's an increasing need now to understand how do we implement that well, how do we address all of the barriers that we've talked about in that kind of model uh, with long-acting injectables and um, clinic uh, visits for the administration of those. Um, but I think what we've learned so far is that having the peer support is important and learning how to implement that together with youth uh, is important as well. And, um, and then again, speaking to the question about um, peer supporters needing to support them and being um, respected as a, a professional part of the care team, I think this is an area where we need to continue to push more, um, making sure that they're well supported, trained, that they're paid well, and that they, um, through interventions like in John Deary, where they have specific uh, skills that they're um, brought up in, in problem solving therapy or mental health interventions that really helps um, give them a lot of uh, prof professional skills and um, respects their role in, in care. Thanks. Um, can I? Yes, so I just wanted to add on actually with regards to support. Um, with us as well, when it comes to support, we understand that um, supporters often go out and share their experiences, which are quite traumatic for them, right? So we do not only support them um, psychologically, but we also support them financially to be able to provide, um, make sure that there isn't any um, burnout or a loss of motiva uh, motivation in doing the work that they do. So I think the only thing I'd like to add to that taking moderator's privilege, is that absolutely recognizing the volunteers' peers as subject matter experts and investing in their development financially, but also that they also are moving in their career trajectory as well and thinking about that as we develop our programming and move forward. So just something to add. I want to not ignore a young, a young lady from Malawi's question, which is about how specifically, intentionally, do you think adolescents can be involved in sort of closing the gap. And I know some of you mentioned, but I think she wanted to hear specifically maybe some additional to her. Well, I think I'll um, comment on that a bit. Um, for me, I, I would like to see adolescents participating more in these programs that are available. Uh, when I look at our program data in, in the Randiri model, we, we track, for example, the number of adolescents that are at a facility and the number of the percentage of adolescents that then choose to enroll in some of these models that we are offering that have been shown through research that they work. And normally we, we don't get to 80%. We, we have adolescents, some of them that are not willing to participate in some of these models. We understand the reasons, but my encouragement is just for participation. I think it would go a long way if all of us could rally behind these models that have been shown to work so that, you know, we can close this treatment gap. I think that would be my first contribution to that. Thank you. We'll take another question up front. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Caroline Omozobe from Nigeria. So um, I've seen where a guardian um, seized the ARVs of an adolescent as punishment. So the adolescents did not take the ARVs for some days. And um, so I don't know in our programming, I don't know who this is, any of you can you know, talk about it. Um, the messages with um, the parents, uh, are we ignoring the guidance? Because some of them actually are not living with their parents. Maybe their parents are dead or something happened and they're living with their guidance. And another one we've seen is this adolescents living with HIV will now automatically be paired with an adult living with HIV to marry, for marriage. You know, um, when um, my sister was sharing about dating, courtship, and relationship, and that is violence. That's violence. It's also early marriage. It's also forced marriage. It's also violence. So I don't know. Well, it could be peculiar to some countries. <laughs> I don't know. And then lastly, how do we engage faith leaders? because we have heard faith leaders speak from the pulpits and some of the messages they are giving are some of them are quite you know full of stigma and discrimination and it will further not give um skills to the adolescent to even open up rather you know they'll have this sense of despair thank you all right thank you um, I would want to uh, respond especially to the first question around um, caregivers. 
and, and apologies, I'll speak more into the model that I'm mostly used to, the, the Jandiri model. So apart from, um, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer support that is being offered by, by the kids to, to, their, to their peers, we find that we also have a, a caregiver interventions as well where we actually have caregiver meetings. And those who had an opportunity to visit our market at the market store, we, we actually had one of uh, the curriculums that we use, we call it Sian Kekela. It's a caregiver intervention, where we just try to also explain to the caregiver so that they get to understand literacy that we've been talking about, understand the issues that affect adolescents so that we don't get end up with those negative attributes that you have been talking about. So I would say, in, as part of our interventions, I think we should include that caregiver component, literacy, to make sure that they understand what is happening with their children or with um, the people that, are take, that they are taking care of so that we don't end up with those uh, adverse uh, events that you are explaining. Thank you. I, I wonder if uh, Cyrus can comment, because we did a lot of talking about HIV literacy among the kids, but I think parents, caregivers, is another piece, and then maybe expanding beyond that. Then we see the one, two, three questions. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I think one of the things I could say about that is um, the importance of just thinking about multi-level uh, nature of our interventions. One of the biggest challenges we found with research in developing adolescent interventions is when you put in multi-level interventions, you're told you're too out of scope. Your study is too big, you know, um, and this, well, there's a big pushback, and we are seeing um, s some good ground, for example, from NIH, where we can now say that I'm going to intervene structurally, and I'm also going to, to intervene at the individual level, and that is acceptable. But for a long time, we've been having a lot of challenges getting this across, um, and this has been review after review. Why do you want to intervene at family level and intervene at the adolescent level? And the question is, really, is because you, you will not make any difference just intervening at the child level. You need to get to their school, you need to go to their caregiver, you need to go to their communities, and that is where you'll have impact. Um, and so just encouraging us to just think about uh, a holistic approach to interventions moving forward. Yeah. Two, then four, then one. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much once again, all the speakers, for those uh, good presentations. Uh, I just wanted to comment uh, on the presentation that Dr. Izzat Tepsan, you presented. Uh, one part about stigma and discrimination, I just wanted to acknowledge the impact that stigma has really uh, impacted the lives of uh, people living with HIV over the years. Uh, I think one of the reasons why young people keep on defaulting on ERT is because they are afraid of the uh, stigma that is there in the community, the stereotype, the norms and the beliefs that people in the community believe about people living with HIV. I just wanted to find out from you what that uh, presentation from the abstract, uh, is it going to inform uh, the changes uh, in what people believe uh, about people living with HIV so that we can get to that um, um, target of uh, zero stigma and discrimination. And also, I uh, just wanted to comment a little bit about uh, youth participation. Uh, I understand that there have been a question about the same, but not only on HIV-related issues, but also uh, back where in my country, I think uh, under ICBD, Malawi as a country committed that uh, in all participations, there have to be 30% of youth participation, not only in HIV. We can talk about technical working groups. We, young people, need to uh, have a presentation uh, in those decision-making platforms. How are we making sure that we are facilitating uh, the change and also making sure that our government uh, really are fulfilling the commitment that they committed? I know it's not only Malawi, even Zambia as a country have their own commitment about youth participation. Kenya, South Africa, all African countries have committed towards youth participation. How are we making sure that uh, we are making uh, it happen? And also, young people, viva young people, viva young people, viva. I want to communicate to all of us, it's now in our hands. I understand the government 
the INGOs, non-government organizations are really trying their best. But now it is left for us to make sure that we walk the action. Are we understanding? We have all the interventions. Of course, we are advocating that we want something that works best for us as young people. But are we, are, are we making the actions? Are we making it happen? So, I just wanted you all to join us, uh, Team Malawi, uh, with an in initiative called It Starts With Us Initiative. It Starts With Us Initiative is an initiative that is making sure that us as young people, we are in the forefront to make sure that we end AIDS by 2030. Thank you so much. Um, my Thank friend, so I did not want to cut you off. So I, that was fantastic. Thank you. I wonder if maybe a quick comment on what specific intentional things can be done to destigmatize, maybe in 30 seconds or less. And then we see we have about four minutes. We'll do two more questions and we have to cut it off. Sorry, and we'll be available afterwards. Sorry about that. But go ahead, because I, I, I hear what can we specifically do about destigma? Um, that was a wonderful comment and I, I maybe have a in terms of addressing stigma we have to think about all the different levels of stigma that adolescents are telling us about and so um, I think one that we don't talk about enough is in the healthcare setting and the stigma that people experience for example if they um, become less to follow up and uh, return to care we often hear stories about how um, they're stigmatized and uh, the ways that they're treated when they're coming back to care and that needs to change um, and so there's multiple ways in which we need to impact uh, care providers in the HIV uh, clinic settings. Um, and then also um, a need for interventions in schools. We hear a lot about stigma that people experience in schools, outdated information, um, things that happen that shouldn't be happening to stigmatize uh, HIV and people living with or affected by HIV. Um, and then I think as far as community-wide uh, efforts, which I think you might be um, speaking to, that's an area that I, I might have to look to my other colleagues to see if, if others can point to some key examples from, from their settings. But it's an area where we need to continue to, to push on all fronts. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, I think um, as she was already spoken into the stigma that happens at the health facilities, I wanted to speak more into uh, self-stigma as well that I spoke about I think in my presentation if you remember research has shown that this can actually be three times more uh, experience other than social stigma that we can talk about and sometimes what we do especially amongst adolescents that are living with HIV we encourage what we call support groups uh, where adolescents come together they get to share their experiences they get to know that sometimes you know I'm not alone who is going through some of these you know um, challenges that I'm facing. I'm not alone who is facing the challenges of stigma that we face in the society. And sometimes when we share these personal experiences, we get to find out that one gets empowered and doesn't get affected so much by the internalized and self-stigma that we are talking about. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I want to speak on those that were presenting on the issues of peer supporters, cats, etc., etc. Um, the support that you guys are talking about, you are talking about psychosocial support, you are talking about mentoring those PA supporters, those kids to make sure that they deliver according to the indicators of the program. But I want to talk on the aspect of compensation because as much as he or she is a PA supporter, they are investing so much time, they are investing a lot when it comes to these initiatives and not even get time to improve in terms of um, skills that can help them to get jobs somewhere else. My question is, when as programmers you are drafting these concepts or these um, initiatives, do you reach out to young people in terms of how you stipulate the amount to be given to that peer supporter at the end of the day because of that, those programs. I want to say currently, I challenge you, all of you that are sitting there, because the packages that you are giving to these peer supporters are next to nothing compared to the work that they are doing on ground. Yeah. We, 
We are asking that you reach out to peer supporters when you are crafting. They will tell you that from those stipends, they pay rentals. From those stipends, they use them for transport. We are asking for integration of support. Thank you so much. Yeah. Completely agree. Given wants to comment on that. Completely agree. Given, go ahead. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I strongly agree and believe in that. Um, briefly, just to mention, I think I did touch on it a bit. Um, peer supporters, as much as they um, commit their time, commit, you know, they provide their stories, sometimes they share their traumatic experiences, and they are rarely supported financially. Maybe they only, in instances, they only get psychological support or no support at all. So um, in terms of financial support, I think it is a very important aspect which we really need to look into when it comes to um, supporting peer supporters, not only psychologically but also financially, to ensure that they isn't burned out and they are, con they are committed, are able to continue do the work with 110% full commitment. So I do agree with that and I think we really need to look in that and when we structuring policies and programs, do consider that in that uh, structuring of programs and policies. Thank you very much. So Dr. Billy wants to make one last comment and then we're going to have to cut off the questions before Kieran brings the hook out. But <laughs> one last comment. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to comment as well and to agree really with um, the comment that has come through around compensation. And we are, we are doing so much work, especially to work with uh, the policymakers so that, you know, these um, peer counselors can be actually be professionalized. And I had a a conversation, I think it was Dr. Valentino from South Africa, where I'm, I'm not so sure if she's still around, where, yes, thank you, where kids have recently been adopted. And the model that is being used in South Africa, they are actually professionalized and they are earning something that is really significant. This is something that we are learning from South Africa to push for such models everywhere. And we are discussing with the funders, with the government, so that these girls can be professionalized because they are doing quite a lot. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. Oh, sorry, no more question. We are running out of time. So sorry. So thank you, everyone, for joining the section. A round of applause for our presenters. And a round of applause for ourselves. Thank you very much. And um, don't forget to complete the online survey, which will be sent to our email by the end of the day. And then we'll be moving to our cafe break together with our postal tour guide. Don't forget that. Thank you very much. <laughs>